afternoon about the James Webb Space Telescope. I'm going to spend about half the talk uh, trying to give you some feeling for where we are technically on this project and the progress that we've made. And then I want to try and spend the second half just sort of talking a bit more about some of the science that we can do with this telescope that uh, is really sort of focused on uh, exoplanet science rather than the first life science that people think of when they think of this telescope. So I put a few sort of 101 charts in here. First one is we still get asked who is James Webb, and the answer is that he was an astro administrator. And I think it's uh, important to point out that, in addition to presiding over the Apollo program, he was also the administrator of the Creative Space Science at NASA, and he actually was responsible for 75 space science missions during his tenure. Uh, so very sort of broad. Um, um, legacy there that uh, is left of those of us who come after him in space science. So let me just start off by telling you who all the players are in the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, Goddard Space Flight Center is the mission lead and the program management for this program. Uh, I'm actually the observatory project scientist, our senior project scientist who leads this program is um, Dr. John Mather, the Nobel laureate. Uh, we have international collaboration for the European Space Agency and the Canadian Space Agency, and I'll show you how that falls into the program. And our prime contractor is an Orthic Raman space technology uh, company, I think they're now called Engaz. And um, they have a, you know, an army of uh, subcontractors who work on different parts of this program for them, and I'll try and highlight those as I go through. The intent is that the operations, science operations of this mission will be done by the Space Telescope Science Institute, much the same way that we do um, Hubble. And then we also have four science instruments. I've kind of highlighted the, um, the uh, contributions there. I'll come back to these later on, so I won't spend a lot of time on this right now. And uh, there's a picture down there that's just a kind of reminder as we go through this. This is a very big telescope, and it's a very challenging program, as I'm sure you're aware by now. So let me start off by just talking about the design of the uh, telescope and talk for a few minutes about the science themes and some of the challenges. So the basic idea of this telescope is it's a cryogenic infrared telescope that is designed to be a passively cooled telescope. The idea being that you get much longer lifetime if you have uh, passive cooling than if you have to rely on cryogenics that are going to be boiling off over the life of the mission. So basic philosophy here is that you have a hot side, which is down here with the spacecraft bus, and a cold side, and then you have a, essentially what's, what's very equivalent to a beach umbrella, if you like, a big sunshade that kind of 
keeps the cold side in the shade so it can cool down. And as long as you don't have too many thermal shorts to the hot side, you can get that part of the telescope cold and do your infrared science. So that's just the basic concept here. The problem is that it's a big telescope. It's a six and a half meter aperture. And we don't have bearings that can fly telescopes like this right now. Plus, um, as one of my colleagues put it, it's a very floppy telescope. So you wouldn't want to launch it like this. So to fly it or to launch it, we actually have to stow most of this hardware away and fold it up. And uh, there was a recent Scientific American article that called it the Origami Telescope. So we have to fold it up to fly it. And that presents additional challenges because you've got to figure out how to uh, unfold everything and deploy things to the right alignments once you're in, um, in orbit and on your way to uh, L2. And then finally, this uh, telescope's going to the second Lagrange point. I think most people here know the benefits, but you know, to briefly summarize, it's a very thermally benign environment, and that's ideal for a cryogenic telescope. It gives us 24-7 science operations, unlike Hubble, which is zooming around the Earth every 90 minutes, and only gives us you know, half of that time to do science. And it's also good for a long night mission because unlike Earth trailing missions, you're not um, faced with the challenges of uh, communications as you get further away from the Earth. So that's why we selected the second Lagrange point. Telescope was designed to address four major science themes. I'm not going to dwell on these right now, but just to sort of emphasize the fact that you know the original uh, concept of this telescope came from the desire to do the first galaxies in the universe. And, that science theme being called first light and ionization. <coughs> and then it's sort of sister theme, if you like, is the assembly of galaxies, how galaxies evolve over time. But it's also going to be able to do great science in the area of both the stars and protoplanetary systems, and then uh, planetary systems and the origin of life. So I'm going to come back and talk about this one uh, towards the end. But this is just to give you a sort of feeling for the kind of breadth of science that we anticipate this telescope doing. So in that, that respect, it's going to be very similar to the Hubble Space Telescope, which has also undertaken a very broad range of different programs. And just to put this thing in context, a kind of reminder, if you like, this is the Hubble Space Telescope primary mirror. This is JWST. This is Spitzer. I tried to put the fields of view and the main cameras um, on this chart just to give you some idea of the different um, you know, scope of the different uh, missions. And then the wavelength coverage is kind of emphasized down here. So JWST is going to basically work from the gold cutoff at around 650 nanometers all the way up to 30 microns, which presents a lot of uh, challenges for the engineering of the program. And uh, because it is so big, uh, that mirror has to be folded up, as I already said. And so we decided to go with the segmented architecture. Um, you can see here the different kinds of fields of view and the sampling. So the basic idea here is that we have a field of view that's slightly bigger for the first light science than the Hubble Space Telescope cameras, uh, advanced camera and wide field three, and gives in, in the infrared similar um, image sizes to what we're getting with um, Hubble in the visible. So they'll be able to do complementary science that sort of meshes in very well with the deep fields that have been done by Hubble and uh, to a lesser extent Spitzer already. So once again, I'm probably laboring this point, but let me just say once more. So the key things that drive the design of this telescope, which I'm now going to start talking about, are sensitivity. If you're going to detect the first galaxies, you need to be able to image in the infrared, and you also need, need to be able to collect a lot of light, so that drives the aperture. You want image quality that's at least in the infrared as good as the first light surveys that we've already done with Hubble. And so we basically want to be diffraction limited at around two microns. We want low backgrounds, so obviously we want a cryogenic telescope, and that drives you to this sort of passive cooling design with this big sun shield that um, allows the telescope to cool. And then the final problem, as I already mentioned, is that this thing's too big to fly as it is, so you've got to be able to fold everything up uh, and then deploy it again after launch. And that drives a lot of the engineering um, challenges. So over the phase, phase A, B, and uh, now uh, just starting to see, we've evolved the design. We've just had a mission CDR in April. And this is what the actual design that we're sort of building to looks like. Uh, it's evolved quite a bit from the original design. We now only have 18 mirror segments. And 
they're actually larger, and I'll come back to some of that in a minute. The shape of the membranes has been fine-tuned so that the telescope is in the shadow, but we don't you know, have much larger arrays of membrane to get out than we, we need. And we've gone to a very managed approach to getting the membranes out so they aren't snagging on hardware as they deploy. And I'll try and show you some of the innovations that, have, that Northrop have come up with to do that. So this is the spacecraft bus. That's pretty st standard. We've changed the design and now have a single, uh, what's called a tail dragger, so the array configuration gives us more clearance to the radiators on the spacecraft bus. And we have this pallet structure, which is the structure that we'll actually package all of that sunshield membrane into so that it's properly stowed and uh, does not start billowing during launch and the um, ev evacuation of the fairing. And then the instruments uh, basically sit in this big pod behind the primary mirror. The primary mirror is mounted to a back plane and the instrument science module is also mounted to that back plane and uh, the instruments basically operate cryogenically. And there is a small box down here which has a lot of the uh, electronics that happen close to the instrument. So that's what we look like these days. Now this program is moving along very fast. Uh, we've actually made a lot of progress, and I'm going to talk, talk about this. But what you see here is all either flight hardware that's already been delivered, or is the uh, flight spare or engineering design units. So the most part, it's flight hardware. I think the Sun Shield is the main area where we're still working with engineering design units and just getting the stuff to build the flight units. So I'm going to talk about a few of these as we go through the, um, the first half of the talk. But let me just talk, first of all, about some of the things that have gone into the design of this telescope. Um, first of all, if you have a segmented mirror telescope, you need to be able to phase it. And we spent a lot of time aboard aerospace working on uh, developing a set of algorithms that will allow us to phase the telescope once it's on orbit. And that work has drawn very heavily on early work that was done to recover from the Hubble spheric aberration. So it's a two-step two process. And the second step uses phase retrieval to do the fine tuning of these mirrors. And so we had to demonstrate that we had all these technologies in hand uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, the primary mirror segments are beryllium, and one of the things we've had to do there is just demonstrate all the way through from the beryllium powder to a final finished mirror with all the actuators, and having gone through by that the mirror works as advertised, we've done that. Uh, probably one of the most challenging technical demonstrations we had to do was the back plane structure. One of the big problems with this telescope is, first of all, it's big, but not only is it big, but it has to operate at 40 Kelvin. So you need to understand what these massive graphite epoxy structures that the mirrors are mounted on do as they cool from ambient down to 40 Kelvin. And you need to be able to predict that extremely precisely at a nanometer level with your finite element models. And that's been a real challenge. So one of the things we did early on in collaboration with uh, ATK who was doing our back plane and also our ISIM structure is develop um, what we call a test article, in this case the best of the back plane test article. And we basically made three mirror segment uh, pieces of this uh, structure, took it down to the Marshall Space Flight Center <coughs> and spent several months thermally cycling it between ambient and um, 40 Kelvin and actually making very precise measurements using a new laser interferometry technique, uh, basically a spectrum interferometry technique to measure at the sort of tens of nanometer level how the thing was moving as it uh, cooled down. And then using that to verify that our finite element models actually do what we think they're going to do, because if they don't, then we're going to have real problems on orbit trying to get everything to phase up. So that was probably, I think, one of the most challenging uh, technologies. The sunshield membranes are another one. These things have to sit there for up to 10 years with the sun blazing away on the bottom layers. And they also have to withstand micrometeroids down to, up, you know, to a certain size. And so we spend a lot of time working on the uh, la different layers and different coatings for these membranes. And then we took them to an Air Force facility in Daytona, basically bombarded them with microparticles <coughs> just to make sure that they would perform as expected. The instrument technologies are sort of more the things that people um, think about when they think about long lead items, the detectors, 
near infrared detectors uh, for the three of the science instruments and the mid infrared, a larger format array than had been flown before. And one of the things we wanted to do was avoid um, having to string long lines of um, analog cable around the telescope, basically take you know, output from the detectors and then have to run it to the hot side of the telescope. And you know, that, those cables would be sitting around other stuff that was controlling actuators and doing you know, various housekeeping engineering activities. So we basically worked with uh, Teledyne to develop um, these uh, ASICs, which are application-specific uh, chips. And they basically sit on the back of the detectors and directly digitize the data so that we can send digital data around the spacecraft bus and the various you know, cables on the system. So we're not you know, going to be so susceptible to EMC as we would if we had very long cables. Uh, we also have a cryo cooler for the mid infrared instrument, so we get a maximum lifetime for it. <coughs> and this one I'll come back to micro shutters, were something that we developed to Goddard uh, to support the European spectrograph and allow us to do multi object spectroscopy. So let me talk about you know, one of the areas where we're making very <coughs> rapid technical progress here, and that's the uh, telescope optics. I've already said quite a bit. Um, the primary <coughs> mirrors are made of 18 mirror segments. Each mirror segment has uh, clusters of actuators that give it six degrees of freedom so that we can you know, really move these things around to optimize the, the figure of the telescope. But uh, they have to, these mirrors have to be um, operational at 40 Kelvin. And in order to select the technology that we wanted to go forward with, we actually built a beryllium and a glass mirror. And after doing a lot of tests, we realized that if we went with glass, we'd have a lot of engineering challenges trying to you know, prevent gradients on the glass and keep that whole you know, part of the telescope very thermally stable. And as you can see, it's just sitting out there looking at the universe. So that's a real challenge. So what we did was um, we ended up selecting beryllium which is much more thermally stable once you get into 40 Kelvin, you can change temperature by tens of degrees and the change in the figure is very small. So that's the main reason we went with beryllium. The downside of beryllium is it takes a lot longer to polish and it's very, um, very different from glass. As you polish, you put um, stress into the beryllium so you have to polish, anneal, polish, measure. And it's a much longer cycle in order to get use usable mirrors. And this is the basic progress process we go through, rather. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but the main points are that they're made of beryllium. You basically take powder. You do something called a hot isostatic press. Now the back, you get this big chunk of beryllium, which you then cut in two to get two mirrors. <coughs> Next thing you want to do is machine most of that away and, and uh, get rid of something like 92% of the material on a mirror. So you machine the back. And this is done by a company in um, Alabama called Axis. <coughs> Basically, machine out lightweight mirrors. And this just shows you the primary, secondary, and tertiary mirror segments in there, you know, to scale. Once you've done that, you have a very thin face plate and this sort of hexagonal structure on the back to keep it stiff. And then you send them to Tinsley, and Tinsley polish them. And as you know, Tinsley have done a lot of space science mirrors for Hubble instruments. They've also done mirrors for Keck. So they're very experienced at doing um, space science applications. And the big difference with these mirrors from normal mirrors is that they have to work at 40 Kelvin. So you have to polish them at room temperature, and at some point, you have to figure out what they look like at 40 Kelvin. So you polish them until you get them to about 150 nanometer surface figure. Then you take them down to Marshall Space Flight Center, and you measure the cryo deformation and that basically gives you the inverse figure that you then have to polish in in that final cycle so that the next time you go back to Marshall and take this mirror down to 40 Kelvin, you've got a 20 nanometer surface error figure on the thing. And this just gives you some idea of this is what the mirror looks like at ambient, and this is the uh, cryogenic surface figure. These are the same scale. This is 20 nanometers. So we basically prototyped all of this processing ahead of time. And then as we did the program, we actually ran one mirror ahead of all the others. So that as we found process issues or problems, we could rectify them before the big batch of 18 flight mirrors came along and sort of ran into a roadblock. So we've been able to keep all the mirrors flowing through the system, and that's really paid off 
So this kind of summarizes where we are right now with the telescope optics. This is the arc optics bench, and it mounts the fine steering mirror, which does tip-tilt corrections. That's this mirror here. And the tertiary mirror, so that's, that's the arc optics bench there. It kind of protrudes in front of the, of the primary mirror and also back into the back plane structure to interface with the instruments. And we have finished the fine steering mirror and coated it. We've also finished the tertiary and coated it. These both meet their requirements. And we have finished the first mirror for the primary mirror, the engineering demonstration unit. And it's been coated. This is what it looks like. And the other mirrors are now rapidly coming up behind it. Uh, the requirement for these mirrors is 20 nanometers. And you see this one sitting at 17.6. And as we've been turning out flight mirrors, they're meeting their requirements. So this is a real achievement from the Ford Aerospace Center to manage this program. And this is just another example showing you the, um, the mirror figure broken down into um, the total and then just a mid-surface frequency um, surface error. Just to give you some idea of the scale, everything on this program is big. So this is the uh, test structure of the Marshall Space Flight Center. This is the XRC air to be tested uh, chamber in. And this is the test jig that they mount these mirrors on. So we can put five mirrors on this jig at a time. And this is how we do the um, cryo deformation measurements and then the final acceptance measurements. So what you're seeing here are four, sorry, five um, unpolished, sorry, uncoated mirrors in their final cryo um, deformation measurement stage. And then this is the engineering demonstration unit going back in for its final acceptance measurement. And it looks kind of clean at the front, but if you look at the back, you know, there's a mounting of uh, cables and wires to support these. So the mirrors are actually mounted with all their actuators, and we move, you know, we move them and actuate them inside the chamber to align them. So we're also exercising all the hardware on the back of these mirrors. So that said, this is where we are with the uh, flight mirror program. We've got um, a flight. First of our flight spares, the tertiary and the fine steering mirror are both coated and finished. We've coated the first three uh, flight mirrors. We've got two more um, ready to be coated. One's going in in two weeks, and we've got another one going in two weeks after that. So by the end of the year, we'll have made really rapid progress in getting these mirrors uh, coated and then ready for their final acceptance. So at the current rate that we're going, by the beginning of the summer next year, we would have finished all of the flight mirrors and done acceptance testing for all of them. At which point they get um, delivered to Goddard in these big, um, essentially, uh, containers that they're used for shipping, and they'll be stored until they're ready to be integrated into the bank plane. One mirror we're still uh, working on is the secondary. We've completed the flight spare, and this just shows you some of the metrology from that. Again, it meets the requirements. Uh, it's a lot harder to test in a uh, secondary mirror, but we've uh, put together two different approaches that allow us to make sure we're not fooling ourselves as we do these complicated cryogenic measurements. And we're actually right now doing the cryo deformation measurements for the secondary mirror, so the expectation is that will be completed early next year as well. So I'm not going to talk too much about the back plane other than to say that it's being put together. Um, it's a very complex graphite epoxy structure with a lot of in-bar and titanium fittings and complex bonding. Um, we're making two of them. So the, the main uh, back plane with the, what we call the wings that fold round with the three primary mirror segments on each side is uh, this structure you see here. This is at 80K. We're also making what's called a pathfinder section that doesn't have the wings. It's basically just this central section. And that's this one here. And this one will be ready early in the new year. And the idea of doing a pathfinder is that we have to test all of this hardware um, that the Johnson Space Flight Center later in the program. So the idea is that we will put two mirrors on the pathfinder and we'll be able to get a lot of um, experience testing these before we put the real flight hardware in there. So we're trying to learn with the pathfinders, again, following the same sort of approach that we've used for the mirrors. You know, figure out how to do things and make sure that all our processes and procedures are correct before we go forward with the flight hardware. 
I said a bit earlier about phasing the telescope. It basically works in two um, uh, sections. You know, one is the coarse phasing, and the second is the uh, fine uh, phasing. When we first um, start taking um, first light images, we're going to have something that looks pretty awful. And so when you do your commissioning, you have this extra um, alignment sequence that you have to do, basically just to get find all the images, get them roughly focused to the same level and then get them all stacked up so that you've got a fairly coarse looking image that you can then use uh, with your dispersed Hartman sensor to get the piston segments. You remove most of the piston errors and then you can use phase retrieval to do the coarse phasing. And the expectation is that we'll have to do fine tuning of the fine phasing probably about once every two to three weeks and the requirement is two weeks. And then we always get questions about, well, what wavelengths and what image quality are you going to be able to work at? So uh, we've been trying to sort of demonstrate this as we go along. And these PSFs here are basically put together from um, our engineering um, test mirror, the first um, primary mirror that we made. And we basically made up a telescope of 18 of those. And the quality of that mirror is actually not as good as the fight mirrors coming after it, which are a lot better. But it gives you some idea of what we what we're able to do. So this is um, a two by two arc second linear scale image, and shows you that we will be um, diffraction limited at two microns. If you look at it on a log scale, you can see that the kind of diffraction structure you would expect <coughs> from um, um, large segmented mirror telescope with uh, geometry that our focal plane has. Uh, sorry, our telescope has. And then this just shows you what it looks like on a larger scale. We can still work, even though we're setting the requirement for wavefront error of 2 microns at much shorter wavelengths and still have really good image quality. So the idea here is just to show you what the 1 micron image quality looks like. And it's not quite diffraction limited, but it's very close. And you know, the quality is still really good, even down to uh, the gold cutoff. So people will be able to do crowded field photometry programs with no, no problem. You know, a lot of the stellar populations work. Following on from what's been done with Hubble. And then the other point, part of this is, well, how do you test this telescope once you've built it? And we learned from Hubble that we have to do end-to-end -end testing of these large optical systems. The challenge here is that we can't do it at ambient. It has to be done at 40 Kelvin, and it's a very big telescope. So you have to find somewhere where you can do an end-to-end -end cryogenic test. And the place that we finally came up with, uh, we initially were planning to go to the Glenn Research Center and use something called the Space Power Facility. Uh, when we looked at what it would take to actually build a stable structure that we could do that test with, we finally concluded that that wasn't a viable approach. And instead, we came up um, in collaboration with ITT, who do a lot of this kind of work and are our major uh, contractor leading the uh, test program with the Johnson Space Flight Center. So this is Chamber A, and it's kind of hard to get an idea of the scale here, but there's actually a computer console just there. I can just show it there, just there. It's about the height of a person. So this facility is extremely big. They used to have the lunar module, the command module, and various other pieces of hardware in there. And they would do these thermal hot cold soaks by rotating it um, inside the structure that half of the wall was covered in you know, very high power lamps. So we've been working over the last couple of years to clean that up, get all that hardware out, and get ready to start doing the test. And the concept that ITT have come up with for this test is to actually suspend the telescope from a set of isolators on the ceiling. So there are actually access points already built into this chamber, so we, we don't have to do a lot of modifications. And it will be suspended from the ceiling, and then there will be a big um, structure at the bottom we call the hoss, which um, allows to prevent the thing swinging around. Main goals of this test are basically three things. Uh, optical alignment is a very big telescope. There are four touch instruments made of different materials, different optical designs. So you really need to be very careful with a telescope like this, that everything is aligned. Your pupils are where you think they are, because if they aren't, then you're going to have major stray light problems, you know, vignetting all those kind of things. So you really need to understand how the whole system works when you get into 40 Kelvin. 
Second thing is optical workmanship. It's a very complicated system. I don't think I need to convince anyone of that. So you know, we we put the thing together as best as we can, but you know, things mistakes happen in construction. Uh, MLI gets sometimes where it shouldn't be, and sometimes things happen that you didn't expect, and you need to be able to catch them on the ground before you fly them. And a good example of that that we found with the primary mirror segments is um, when we were doing testing of the first mirror segment, we actually found uh, um, that the shroud around one of the cables was getting so stiff that it got cold that it was actually able to push on one of the actuators and we were seeing you know, major astigmatism sort of appear in the mirror as we cooled it down. And uh, we went back and looked at the design and we still don't quite understand exactly how this stuff is doing it, but we had to go back and redesign the layouts for the cables on the back of the mirror. So you need to be able to catch this stuff on the ground because you can't fix it once it's up there. And then finally, uh, thermal balance. We need to make sure that this whole uh, telescope structure, what we call the OTE, and then the instruments module, the ISIM, um, we call the whole thing now the OTIS, we need to make sure that will actually get down to the temperature it needs to be to operate. And uh, that we have no thermal shorts or any other workman issues workmanship issues which prevent it from getting the temperature. So that's why we're doing this test and that's why we need to do this test. Okay, I'm almost running to an end here on the first half of this talk, but let me just um, talk for a few minutes about the sun shield because everybody always wants to know about the sun shield and the usual questions are how do you know it's going to work, have you ever done this before, <coughs> so on and so forth. So I want to just take a few minutes to just talk about the sun shield. Um, <coughs> It's a very large deployable structure, and this is one of the reasons Northrop won the contract originally, because that's their business. They do large deployable structures. And the question and answer session at the end, I can show you a few. Um, membranes are a whole new story, so we built a number of pathfinders again as we've gone through this program to understand things about the membrane that we need to know in order to make this telescope work. And the first one is, how do you fold something this big? And how do you fold it so that you can do three or four deployments during your integration and test phase to make sure it works, and not have all the coatings on the membranes come off because of abrasion? So we've done a lot of work understanding how you actually fold this thing. The next thing is, you want to make sure that when it's all folded up and you're sitting in the Ariane fairing on the way to L2, that as that fairing evacuates, the thing isn't billowing around and getting caught and stuff so that when you start to do the deployment, it's not going to come out properly because it's all up on stuff. So we've spent a lot of time working on a packaging concept. And in fact, we actually now essentially package it down on these pallets so that everything is properly managed. And when we do our evacuation tests, we don't see any um, unpleasant behavior. And then the final one is, how do you make these things to the kind of um, uh, alignments that you will need? I mean, we need we need on these membranes to have them all line up to something like uh, five, 10 millimeters. So that um, you aren't seeing, the telescope isn't seeing a layer at the bottom that's much warmer than it should see. So you need to understand how, how to model these things and how to put them together so that even though you're in gravity, when you get on orbit, they line up properly. So Northrop have been doing a lot of this kind of work with evolutionary pathfinders, a lot of very sort of state-of-the-art and pushing the envelope um, finite element modeling. And you know they built specific test articles to test different things. And this is just an example of a model they built to explore how they could get the separation of the layers in the core region around the spacecraft. So that's right in here. This one is a spandex model they built, and this was part of their early um, studies into how you model these things and understand the um, shapes that you're going to get. And again, this region here just shows you the, essentially what the membrane looks like around this rim, and they've been doing a lot of work modeling the shape there because it's extremely steep gradients, and there's not a lot of clearance in the hardware in there, so you need to understand that your models are working properly. We also need to check the most important thing, does the sun shield actually work? And again, you know, we have the scale problem. We don't have somewhere where we can test a full scale five layer sun shield and figure out that it's actually working properly. So we finally came up with a test where we build a third scale 
And you can see the first four layers there, they're just installing the fifth layer right in this picture. And then we did a thermal vacuum test and a thermal balance test to make sure that the models agree with uh, performance in the tank. And then finally, how do you get this thing out? So this, this is the other major area that Northrop have been working on. And this just shows you the two pallets, and they're just in this picture doing a deployment test. So the membrane is basically pulled out by a big boom called the mid-boom. And they have a number of very neat technologies capped on springs and so on that prevent each of the layers from billowing as they you know, pull them out and deploy them. And finally, as I said, you know, there's a lot of clearances that are pretty tight in this design. So they've also built the backplane structure. And what they're doing here now is um, using the two pallets and the backplane structure to do things like clearance checking, figure out where the metrology is going to go. You, know, you need to do a lot of very complex metrology to align everything. And one of the things is where can you look and where do you have constant access to uh, tooling balls and cubes as you put this thing together and start to integrate it. So they built these mock-ups to do this and then also to explore um, how, how best to um, do the packaging for stowing with the two uh, pallet parts. Okay, that's um, the launches in Ariane 5, that's one of the European contributions. And what I'm going to do now is skip through the instruments other than just give you an overview and talk a bit about the, the uh, science that we can do in the exoplanet area. So I put this figure together to try and show schematically how the different science areas relate to different instruments. Uh, NearCam is designed to do deep, wide field broadband imaging, and it will have a field of view that looks like this. And most of the science it will do will be, you know, first light science. It also does the wavefront sensing. It does the measurements to figure out the phasing of the telescope. And we can actually, it turns out, use the hardware it has to do that. We're also doing exoplanet science, believe it or not. And I'll show you how that works in a minute. And then NearCam also has some chronographs. The European instrument is NearSpec. It does multiple object infrared spectroscopy. It also has an integral field unit for doing uh, cores of galaxies, that kind of science. And it has a suite of uh, long slits. And we just recently had them do some modifications to that suite so that we can do um, spectroscopic um, observations of transits. MIRI is the uh, European Consortium and JPL instrument. It's primarily designed to do mid-infrared wide field imaging. It also does IFU spectroscopy. And it also has a suite of mid-infrared chronographs. And finally, the Canadian instrument does fine guidance, uh, moving target support, basically points the telescope and keeps it pointed. And it also has a tunable um, imaging capability combined with a chronograph. So those are the science capabilities we have for doing um, exoplanet science. And what I'm going to do now is just skip through these. If people have questions about the instruments at the end, we can come back to those. And likewise, the sensitivity. So, as I said, we have two basic themes on this telescope um, that relate to the kind of science that people doing exoplanet science are interested in. The first one is birth of stars and protoplanetary systems. And it tries to follow the early stages of uh, planetary system formation and stellar evolution and tries to answer these kind of questions. You know, how do protostellar clouds collapse? Um, what kind of role does environment play? What is the initial mass function of substellar masses? And then how do protoplanetary systems form? And just to give you some examples of the kinds of things we expect we'll be able to do, um, so JWST will be able to image young disks in molecular lines. And basically, you know, very simple rule of thumb, JWST can take spectra of just about everything spectra can take an image of. So that gives you some idea of the kind of power it has. And uh, this is an example of um, the kind of science Miri can do where it can actually resolve the cause of these young protostellar objects. It will also be able to do hot gas phase chemistry in future habitable zones of um, low, low mass stars. And this characterization, um, this is some very early work that was done with ISO showing you know, how the infrared spectra um, evolves as you go from you know, very young YSO to mature disks. 
and it's a recent example here that was done with uh, Spitzer. So we'll be able to really attack all of these areas in great, great detail. <coughs> Spitzer's done a lot of work um, in the area of debris disks. Here we'll be able to characterize certain stellar disk evolution in that really interesting 5 to 30 mega year period in dense clusters all the way up to 2 kiloparsecs and down to about 1 Earth mass. So we can rebuild on the work that Spitz has been doing. And then our second science theme is um, it's of interest here is planetary systems in origin and life. And this theme involves looking at solar system objects but a lot of the emphasis right now is exoplanet science and doing um, exoplanet imaging and exoplanet um, spectroscopy. So let me talk about the kind of things we can do with these coronagraphs. As you can see, we have a lot of different capabilities. NearCam has a set of band-limited um, occulting masks. The tunable filter coronagraph the Canadians have would allow you to use the technique of differential spectral imaging. And this technique's already been used to great effect by Mawad et al in discovering the three planets around HR 8799. We've also had the recent addition by the Canadians of a non-redundant mask that allows you to do closure phase imaging. And the neat thing about that is you can actually get into half lander over D, albeit at a cost of uh, lower contrast. And then finally, the mid-infrared instrument has three quadrant phase mask um, coronagraphs, which basically are a kind of nulling coronagraph. And then it has uh, 20 microns, one Leo coronagraph. And each of these chronographs adhere to a specific wavelength. So the three quadrant phase cover the sort of um, 5 to uh, 15 micron band passes, and the VO covers a 20 micron. It's not going to be easy doing coronography with this telescope because it wasn't designed to do coronography, and it's got a lot of uh, diffraction issues. I think it's the best way to say it. But these simulations by John Chris give you some idea of how the near-cam chronograph will work and that can actually do some very interesting um, exoplanet imaging that will be very complementary with what we're able to do right now on the ground and also push in certain areas. And one area that's particularly interesting is doing late-type stars where from the ground you're always going to get stuck with the uh, sky background and if you're doing this with JWST you get get to go you know, beyond what you could do on the ground by virtue of the fact that you have much lower backgrounds. So if I just compare these coronagraphs to two of the um, coronagraphs being considered for the ground right now, uh, P1640 is an instrument being put together for the Hale telescope, and this is the predictive performance. The TMT is planning some kind of coronagraph that will have some performance along these lines. And I should just say, this, these come from a paper by Bajman et al. We basically took all the instrument teams and got them all to try and document the performance of their instruments. So the wavelengths of these instruments differs quite considerably as well. Uh, MIRI is, doesn't get to very high contrast, but it does have the benefit of being able to work out at 10 to 30 microns, which is pretty important because we aren't able to do a lot of that on the ground right now. This shows you the nominal performance of the near-cam coronagraph. And then this one here is that closure phase imaging mask. So you see the contrast isn't quite so good, but it gets you into half a lambda over D, so you can work in very close to uh, targets. And then the Canadians have this uh, approach to doing their science called differential, um, or spectral differential imaging. There are a number of different names for this. And the idea there is that in addition to doing the coronography, you can take a sequence of images in fairly narrow band passes and then use those to remove the speckle pattern. Uh, this technique, as I said, is used on the ground at the moment in different guises. You know, some people use narrow band filters, others actually uh, let the Naismith rotator on the telescope just run <coughs> freely and then take a sequence of images and remove um, the signature of the telescope that way. But the basic point is that the Canadians think they can you, in, using their tunable filter, which has R of 100 narrowband imaging, they can combine that with their coronagraph, which is very similar to the near-camp coronagraph, and get probably about an order of magnitude um, better contrast than you would with the near-camp coronagraphs. And uh, M. Berlio did a simulation just showing the kind of image you get of HR 8799 if you were 
doing this kind of science. Resolving debris disks and look, looking for planets by sort of indirect detection is another approach. Uh, we've made a lot of headway with the uh, Hubble coronagraphs in this area. This is a uh, sort of rogues gallery of uh, debris disks I put together, mainly taken with the advanced camera for surveys. And of course, um, we use that approach uh, with former Hub to actually find what appears to be a planet in the former Hub system by using the properties of the disk to look for an exoplanet. And I should just say, we've actually just taken more data and recovered this planet for the third and fourth time. So that, that will be coming out uh, later in the year, hopefully as a new paper. But the basic idea is that um, you can do both disk morphology and indirect um, imaging of exoplanets with JWST using this technique. There's a lot of papers out there now by people like Callas and Stark and Kushner talking about the kind of structures you would see in debris disks you know, for different kinds of uh, planetary systems. And the other benefit of JWST is that you can actually start to differentiate the different um, structures in these disks. So this is a Spitzer 20 micron image of Formica. And the idea here is that you can see warm dust, but you can't actually resolve it. This is the Hubble Space Telescope reflected light image of the cooler dust further out. And uh, George Rieke and Jeff Ryden did this simulation showing how JW would be able to image both that cool outer ring and the warm inner ring, and in fact also capture any uh, exoplanets that were here. So uh, the instrument science teams have done a lot of work to try and understand what kind of capabilities they have. And the basic um, conclusion is that they think for imaging young planets that are still self-luminous up to about 200 mega years, they should be able to do exoplanets down to about 0.2 Jupiter masses at distances of 10 AU or greater. And then this area which is really interesting is starting to look for planets around nearby M stars. And there we think we can do um, 2 Jupiter mass or greater at distances as small as a few AU thanks to that closure phase imaging technique. And then the nice thing is if you combine the near cam and the MIRI data, so you've got uh, 5 and uh, 10, 15 micron data, you can start to um, you know, get very good, um, start to attack some of the degeneracies in these models. So just to summarize, this kind of shows you where we are in the sort of parameter space of planet detection. This is uh, companion mass, and this is semi-major axis. Most of the ground-based surveys now are kind of working in this, or will work in this region here. I should thank uh, Chaz and Mike Meyer for this plot. And JWST will push down into this new area that's um, highlighted in yellow, and it may actually go down further. One of the things that's very hard to do with coronagraphs is predict their exact performance until you understand just how stable they're going to be uh, on orbit. And as we start to get uh, the final design of the telescope and very solid models for stability combined with the final performance of our mirrors, we'll be able to really start to refine these and figure out exactly what our parameter space looks like. The other major area that people are getting very interested in is transiting exoplanets. And since we have so many Kepler people here, I'm not going to um, talk about what transiting exoplanets are, because I think that's a given. But one of the things I wanted to talk about is what JWST can do in this area. And uh, it, given the, the a large amount of interest right now, the science working group for JWST actually did a review of what the telescope could do and uh, put together a report and a white paper for the decadal survey. But this basically summarizes the key sort of features that we think are important. You know, we have a low background, so we're L2, cryogenic telescope. We worked with the instrument teams to make sure we have the appropriate kind of apertures for doing uh, spectroscopic um, and imaging transit science. So we especially worked with the European team near camp to make sure we had a very large aperture for doing um, transit spectroscopy. We have very long dwell times, so we can sit there very much the same way that Spitzer does and capture a whole uh, transit. It's not going to be like HST where you have to keep coming back and grabbing a piece of it. And we have very good image quality. We have what we expect to be a very stable point spread function. And we also have a lot of degrees of freedom on the OTE, although I'm not, I'm not supposed to mention that one anymore. 
Uh, one, one of the things we looked at was whether we could you know, partially defocus images for doing certain kinds of transit science. It turns out we may not need to. And we also have a pretty good idea of what our pointing is going to be. You know, one of the challenges on Spitzer has been dealing with things like drift and you know, removing all of those uh, systematics. And we've been working, with, uh, I've been working in some detail with Drake Deming to try and understand how things worked on Spitzer and then do modeling as you'll see in a minute, to try and understand what we think we would see uh, with JWST. And then, as I said, you know, with the detectors, uh, we have this director digital readout, so hopefully we can minimize um, detector systematics. And combined with that, we have three phases of ground testing, so we can really get to understand you know, the other major sources of systematics, which are the detectors. So if you take all of our science instruments and you look at them to see what modes there are for doing transit science, it turns out there's a lot. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these, but I want to just highlight one. And that is, if you want to do uh, very high precision transit um, light curves, you ideally would like to um, not be limited by the fact you have a massive telescope and a very sharp ESF, because you're going to saturate on you know, even faint stars very quickly. Well, it turns out that that hardware that we use for doing the phase retrieval to figure out the phasing of our telescope actually is available for doing other things. And the way we do phase retrieval is we take a sequence of out-of-focus images on either side of focus, and then we sort of analyze that data to get our um, optimum solution for phasing the telescope. But we can actually use the hardware that we use to make those out-of-focus images to do transit science because they're basically just lenses that defocus the image. So even though we have a massive telescope with a great point spread function, if we want to do very high precision light curves, we can actually use the phase retrieval lenses in NearCam to defocus the beam <coughs> at different levels depending on how bright the star is. So you can spread out the light, you can get you know, pretty good count rates combined with you know, medium-sized subarrays <coughs> on you know, pretty bright stars. You know, if we think we can go up to K of uh, three magnitude stars with this technique. And that's obviously very good. The other thing that we have on uh, NearCam that wasn't designed for transit science is um, a set of rhythms that are designed as a sort of backup to allow us to measure segment piston errors. And we can actually use those slipless uh, rhythms for doing science as well for the transit work. So this kind of summarizes, I'm just going to go through now what we think we can do in this area. Um, for NearCam, we can do high precision two-channel photometry, so we can actually get the primary and secondary transits, um, light curves in one shot. Uh, we think we can probably do uh, very high precision uh, light curves and even be able to detect uh, terrestrial planets. We're still working on doing simulations of that, but given the ability to get lots of photons with defocused images, we think that's a good possibility. Uh, some of this stuff you, of course, already know. You can get mass, transit timing, um, do detection of moons, and you can also do reflectance and thermal phase variations across the whole light curve. And then with this RISM capability, we can also do primary and secondary spectroscopic transits of hot Jupiters that are in a thousand, and hopefully be able to do secondary transits of hot Earths at about R of 50. Now, the European camera is going to be the workhorse for doing this kind of science, probably. And as I said, we recently got them to add a new slit to their mask before they actually made it, so there wasn't a cost impact. And they put in a 1.6 by 1.6 R second slit. So you can do, you know, not slitless spectroscopy, but quasi slitless so you're not um, seeing small variations due to the point of the <coughs> telescope as you do your observations. So near spec can do prime, primary and secondary transits, short and long wavelength spectroscopy, so one to two and a half and two and a half to five microns. It will be able to do hot Jupiters, hot Neptunes. I've got a couple of examples here of a K of 12 analog to HD 209458 that Jeff Valenti did for the near spec science team. We also think we may be able to do some super Earths, and I'll put some caveats on that in a second. But we will be able to do, we think, very high precision uh, transit spectroscopy of uh, hot Jupiters and <coughs> hot Neptunes. And uh, this uh, is a simulation of an observation of GJ436b, sorry, the B dropped out there, 
um, Sarah Siegel provided us with this model. We basically did a simulation of the observation with the JWST point spread function, the uh, pointing model, and the detector um, pixel response function. So we tried to put as much into this as we could. And the red line is the, um, is the model spectra, and then the dots show the kind of observation that you would get. So we think you can do very high precision work uh, in some, for quite a lot of these uh, objects. This is a, a, a mini Neptune or a very uh, hydrogen rich super Earth, depending on who's, you know, what kind of point of view you have. Uh, this was also provided by Sarah Siegel, and this just shows a simulation of 20 transits bin to R of uh, 300 with a 1% flat field. And again, you know, the blue points are the simulation and the red underlying that is the um, observation. Uh, question is, can you do super Earths? And we think you can do super Earths if you can find the right targets. And uh, Dave Charbonneau has his MERS study. We hope we'll get tests to find suitable targets for JWST. The problem is that they are challenging. This is a simulation I did with Drake Deming. And uh, you can see we can just about detect the carbon dioxide line. But this took 100 transits of near spec, you know, been to R of 100. And so what we ideally want, if we're going to try to do this kind of science, are uh, um, the right kind of uh, bright stars in the, <coughs> with transiting systems in the right part of the sky so we can get lots and lots of uh, return visits. And then finally, just to finish up on this, uh, MIRI, the mid infrared instrument, will also, uh, we think, be very useful for doing this kind of science. We're still doing a lot of work to try and understand exactly what it can do, but the MIRI team think that they can, um, they'll be able to do R of 100 hot Jupiter emission spectra in a single transit. They think they might be able to get down to one to two Earth radius um, planets, transiting GK and M stars. And we also have a spectrograph on MIRI, which um, we think will be really ideal for doing specific spectral features. But the downside is that it's going to take a lot of calibration work given the way you have to calibrate these observations. So there's a lot of promise there, and there's a lot of work going on. I'm working with Drake Gaming on trying to simulate some of these things. So just to finish up, these are the kind of programs that you can do with JWST uh, in this field. And you know, just the amazing advances made by Spitzer already give you some idea of you know, what we'll be able to do future with the James Webb Space Telescope. So finally, let me just finish up and hopefully I've convinced you that we're making a lot of excellent technical pro pro progress. Uh, JWST will be the dominant astrophysical facility for a decade. And uh, I just also noted that you know a lot of the science JWST will do underpins a lot of the 2010 decadal survey as well as the 2000. And we have the capability to address these new observing opportunities, such as exoplanet science. And I will finish there, and I'll run the deployment video, so mm -hmm. people have questions, and ask them, and you can watch that as well. Thank you. Mark, can I just kick off the questions? Sure. <laughs> so uh, you mentioned the primary, secondary, and tertiary mirrors. Can you Tell us a little bit about how they interact together. What's the role of the yeah. secondaries and tertiaries? The um, James Webb is a three mirror and a sigma. It's designed to give you a very large field of view with fairly you know, constant image quality over that large field of view. So basically, the uh, tertiary is a fixed mirror in the system. Then you adjust the primary and the secondary to optimize your um, metric, whatever that might be. In our case, it's a wavefront error. So when we set up and align the telescope, we're optimizing uh, to a wavefront error metric. So we have something like 130 nanometers across the fields of view of all the science instruments. And, and where are the tertiary uh, and secondary mirrors located then? So the secondary is, is on that large um, deployable boom and sits in front of the uh, primary mirror. And it basically is on a tripod that essentially folds up deployment um, and to, to be launched. The tertiary and the fine steering mirror sit inside that arc optics uh, bench I showed you, the big beryllium optical bench, and you can actually see it just here. It's that 
people acting there. It's a, bat, it's a combination of a battle and an optical bench. So it mounts the two, op, the two optics, the tertiary, which is the third mirror in the optical system, and then the fine steering mirror, which does the tip tilt to get the fine um, jitter removed. And it also serves to remove straight line. Thanks, Mark, for this interesting talk. Um, I have a question kind of about exoplanets specifically. So today we know 500 exoplanets, and I think there is like 30 of them which has been characterized by transit. Yeah. So could you tell us how many of these 30 transit planets we could, we could observe using long six spectroscopy with a JWST uh, in the infrared? I think you can do them all. All of them? Yes. So it's going to be like 30 spectra of exoplanets. I'm assuming with such a large primary mirror that's just exposed to space, that you're going to accumulate micrometeorite impacts pretty quickly. Are yes. there models about how long, um, you know, the mirror, you know, what, sort of what the damage level will look like over time? We have um, a micrometeoroid spec for the primary mirror, so we expect that they will see impacts over their lifetime and is built into the straight light spec. So we kind of, a lot of our performance specifications are at the end of life. Uh, isn't beryllium uh, isn't beryllium toxic and or some of the problems uh, putting those uh, mirrors together? Beryllium is toxic, yes. Um, so I think you know one of the big risks when we did the selection of the mirrors, I, one of the big risks we actually saw was getting approval for Tinsley to actually be able to have the plant in Richmond to do the processing of the mirrors. The, the main challenge is that you have to um, be on top of managing your environmental uh, or the environment at the place where you're doing mirrors. So for instance, when they machine them an axis, they, they have them mounted in what these massive machines that look like giant shower booths. And they're essentially sealed. So <coughs> when they start machining them, you, they just you know, drown them with, with fluid, which collects most of the beryllium powder. Um, I, I haven't seen how they do this at, um, at Tinsley. Uh, but again, they have a, a set of procedures that they follow, and you know, Tinsley have a lot of experience with Beridium. They did one of the spits and mirrors, and they've done mirrors for other programs as well. So the bottom line is you have to follow the practices, and you, know, you should be fine. One of the bad things about Beridium is that once you've coated the mirror, it's not like glass. If you don't like the coating, you've got to go and machine it off. You can't just you know, remove it. Um, one of the first things to deploy in your, Mark, Sorry. over here. One of the first things to deploy in that film was your communications antenna. Yes. Um, have you worried about its impact on the shielded zone in the moon for radio quiet? I'm sorry, have you worried about its impact on? There is an ITU uh, regulated shielded zone of the moon, right, on the far side. Yeah. That's supposed to remain radio quiet. And have you looked at what the impact of the Communications Act to Earth will do in that zone? Um, I have to be honest. I, I haven't personally looked at that, but I, I'm sure it's part of the, the uh, set of requirements that Northrop have to work to. I mean, they're aware of these issues. Um, but again, I'd have to go check on that. One, one thing to remember, we're not actually at L2. We're, we all get L2, so we're never actually you know, right behind the Earth or you know, go around the big areas. You mentioned the lifespan. How, how long do you expect uh, to, what is the end of life period? Is it limited by the, primarily by the sarah fluid? And is the cryo fluid refillable? And also, um, on the Mary, uh, do you have digital phase information from those, uh, around 10 microns, you get phase data? Uh, so uh, the first question was lifetime. So the design lifetime is five years, and the goal is that we operate this thing uh, for 10 years. The um, main consumable is not cryogenics, because the one instrument that has to go colder than 40 Kelvin is MIRI, where the detectors have to be cooled to around, I think, 8K, 7, 8K. 
and there we're using a mechanical cryocooler. So the main consumables are propellant to do orbit maintenance, to keep you in that big orbit around Earth 2, and to do uh, momentum unloads. You know, that, that solar shield is very big, and it's like a big sail. And you're continually sort of, the reaction mills continually sort of fighting to keep the telescope aligned. And so they build up a lot of momentum, and you have to do burns every three or four days just to unload that. So that's the primary consumable. And then I think the last question was, did we measure phase? Yeah, very good phase uh, from the infrared around 10 microns. Do you get any phase I don't believe so, no. I was just watching the um, deployment uh, simulation. Um, can I ask a bit of a, like a skeptical question? How many single point failures do you have during this all, all this deployment? <laughs> and, and a follow-up question, do you have some kind of like plan B? In other words, are there contingency plans regarding the deployment? Uh, the answer is yes, there are single point failures because you can't design these things in a way that there, there isn't. Um, I guess the things I would note are that there's a lot of um, large hardware flying these days. And, you know, people want to see at the end, come up here, I can show you a sort of 12 meter dish deploying that was flown a couple of years ago. So the, our commercial colleagues are flying big hardware all the time now and you know, unfolding antennas that are up to 18 meters large so you can have mobile phones, satcoms, cable TV, whatever. So there's a lot of experience building up now in how to build these things and how to manage them. Um, the way we are doing it is making sure that we have, you know, identify risks and address them and we have very detailed risk process and you know our, our standing review board has come back several times and made suggestions about how we can improve the uh, testing of the sun shield by doing a lot of subsystem testing at different temperatures that kind of thing so that's that's what we're doing about making sure it works uh, in terms of plan b i mean most most space flight missions that are flown don't don't have the luxury of being serviced like hubble has so you know you have to um, basically do as much as you can on the ground during verification to make sure they work as you want them to. Will you have a second instrument? I'm sorry? Uh, will, you have a second? Uh, will you have a second instrument? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. You may uh, have if, 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 if first screws up, will you be able to Well, we have four second? science instruments, and, and some I, of them I, have. I, I didn't mean that. I meant the second uh, JWST. Exactly. Uh, there are no plans to build another one. Well, it's a related question that you spend, everyone spends years and years and years of your professional life on this thing, and you put it in a rocket, <laughs> and then just, just maybe something goes wrong. How do you deal with that? Are there therapists? That's <laughs> called <laughs> that. I mean, it's part of the business. You know, advanced cam I worked on advanced camera before this, and we, we won the proposal, got selected in 93. We thought we were going to go in 99. Hubble had this big uh, problem. We had to wait you know, two and a half years and another service emission before we got to do ours. And, you know, we just you do your research, and you, you work the program. Okay, uh, if we have any more questions, I'm sure Mark will uh, be here for a few seconds to, uh, to at least uh, address those. Uh, next week we have a, a very rare break in the series. Uh, Mark's talk will be available on YouTube. If you want to recommend it in four weeks' time. Uh, so I encourage you to uh, go check that out. Mark, we have a uh, special memento. Enjoy me thanking Mark.